Tema Talks is brought to you by the Tema Conter Memorial Trust, which is Canada's leading provider of peer support, family assistance, education and training for emergency services, public safety, military personnel, and their families. Check out tema.ca for more information. The views, opinions, and endorsements expressed in each podcast episode are those of the host and the guest alone, and do not necessarily reflect the official position of the Tema Conter Memorial Trust. The subject matter of this podcast may be triggering for some listeners. Please take the time to get yourself in a calm and positive mind space before listening so you can get the most out of the podcast. Okay, cue the music and enjoy this episode of Tema Talks. Hello, people, and welcome to Tema Talks. How are you? I'm doing okay. June is PTSD Awareness Month. And I'm going to do my part. And my part is this. In June, I'm going to be putting out eight podcasts. Every Monday and Thursday in June, there's going to be a new episode. So get well rested. Free up lots of space in your phone. It's going to be a busy month. As it should be. I hope you enjoy it. A little bit of housekeeping to start off with. You may have been uh, seeing recently a lot of posts from the Temecon Memorial Trust with a phone number to call. It says we're listening. You can call. It's one triple eight two eight 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 zero three six. I just want to clarify, that is an information line and a line that you can call in and request information. It is not manned 24-7. So in saying that, it is not a crisis line and should not be used as such. If you are experiencing a mental health crisis, please contact your local crisis center, family doctor, go to the nearest hospital, or call 911. Got it? Good. Perfect. Now I'm going to have a little rant. Sometimes I like to do that. And my rant this episode is about something I'm going to call mental health support shaming. I've seen this happen before and just happened recently. I'm not going to name any names. Those of you in the know will know what I'm talking about. We had a brave person come out and ask for help. And they did so through a social media post. Great. Lots of love and support was given. An initiative was uh, started, and this wasn't initiated by the family, but a friend of the family. A funding page was set up to help cover some costs that may be incurred for this person trying to get help. Great. Another great thing. Perfect. The person looking for help received some negative comments, some scathing comments. One of them I saw. And in this comment, a reference was made to the fact that the person making the comment, you know, went through, a uh, person that was asking for help went through their social media and saw that they travel a lot and they seem to be living a great life and really happy and, you know, in, in their words, were flaunting that good life and made a judgment on this person that they should not be asking for help because they don't need it. That's wrong, people. We should not be doing that. That's major steps backward in this movement. Mental illness does not care about your status in life. Doesn't care how many followers you have on social media. Doesn't care about your race. Doesn't care about what patch of dirt you were born on. Doesn't care about your gender. Doesn't care how you identify doesn't care how good a job you have. It simply does not care. It does not discriminate. It can affect anybody, regardless of anything. So please, refrain from judging. As I say, more love, less judgment. We're really good. People who are struggling are really good at putting on a front that everything's okay. They'll tell you they're fine. 
They'll take happy selfies. They'll look great. Inside, they may not be. They could be falling apart. So don't judge people. If you cannot support or do not have anything supportive to say, just don't say anything. Okay? We need to not have this negative, these negative comments because what happens is the person asking for help now feels bad for asking for it, which is exactly the opposite effect that we are trying to have. It's opposite of the message we are trying to send, that it is safe to ask for help. Anyway, don't judge people. Okay? I think you get it. I think you guys all understand that very well. But it needed to be said, and I said it, so we're done. Stay tuned at the end of this episode. Uh, I'll be telling you about a few events that are going on, maybe in your area. So if you want to hear about those, uh, stay tuned. I don't know if you know where you were on April 19th, 1995. But I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember being glued to my television set watching a watching a mass casualty traumatic incident unfold on a global stage glued to my television it was the Oklahoma City bombing 168 people at least died that day and more than 680 people were injured my guest this episode is Oklahoma City firefighter Chris Fields. This event changed his life. You may remember an iconic photograph of a firefighter holding an infant that was pulled from the rubble that day. That was Chris. It was such an honor to talk to him. It was a very powerful conversation. Let's get to it. It was a dark and stormy night Nor'easter rolling in. Welcome to Tema Talks, Chris. It is an immense pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure and honor to to be here with y'all. Well, thank you. Joining us all the way from Oklahoma City, I presume? Uh, Hey, yes, sir. Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. (laughs) Excellent, excellent, Chris. Um, If you don't mind just just to start off, I'd like to just learn some more about you. So can you just talk to us about, you know, how you grew up, what your upbringing was like, and what led you to the fire service? Yes, I'm born and raised right here in Oklahoma. Uh, Grew up in southwestern part of Oklahoma City and um, grew up in a Christian home. Uh, Mom always had me at church, and I grew up in a, we had a program called uh, Royal Ambassadors. It was like a, I kind of like Boy Scouts, I guess, at the okay. church, basically. Yeah. And uh, one of my uh, one of my leaders of that group was a man named Benny Zellner. He was a Oklahoma City firefighter, so I kind of kind of uh, drew me towards it. My uncle was a firefighter, and then my best friend growing up was uh, his dad was the preacher at our church, but he was also the chaplain of the Oklahoma City Fire Department. Okay. So I. Uh, so I grew up running around with him, you know, when, you know, before we was old enough to drive and do our own run around the weekends, I'd stay with him and his dad go visit the fire station. So I kind of grew up around it a little bit that way. And then our, our, the church I grew up at was, oh man, I bet there was, there was probably 30 minimum of Oklahoma City firefighters that went to church there because hmm. the pastor was a chaplain, of course. So this kind of grew up around the environment a little bit and always felt that's what I, I, I wanted to do. And uh, was lucky enough to to apply and, and get hired. <laughs> so. Now, how old were you when you uh, applied and got in there? Um, I, I got hired July twelfth. Uh, my rookie school started July twelfth in nineteen eighty five, and I was two weeks shy of being twenty one years old. Wow! Now so I got I, an early start. I, I obviously, I read uh, through your bio. You have uh, you were uh, involved with the fire service for thirty one years with Oklahoma City. Uh, thirty one, yes, sir. Thirty one years, seven months, and sixteen days. As of uh, <laughs> March March first, just last week, I've been retired one year. Wow. Okay. And I know that you retired as a major. So for me, mm-hmm. involved in the fire service here, our rankings go a little bit different. Can you just explain the ranking system inside the fire service there? Uh, sure. Now, it's of course it's changed a little bit since I first came on, but it's still it's a 
it's you know you start out as a you know probie rookie new boy whatever you want to call them and then right. uh, uh, go to firefighter and then years ago they negotiated a deal for guys to get uh, more education they added these little steps in between they weren't around when I was coming up but after three years you can become what they call a corporal you're basically just a certified relief driver but okay. you have to go to an academy and get this extra case, I mean, education. So it goes on up to a driver, which is a sergeant's rank. And then in between, and then there's a captain and then a, a major. And a major is just an extension of captain. It's just a major has gone to a two week academy and furthered his education a little bit and has become a major. And basically you're a station officer. Um, I was in charge of my fire station on my shift. And also served as a ride out, meaning if the district chief for that district that I was in, which was made up Oklahoma City, there's 37 fire stations. We cover okay. 620, 620 square miles, Oklahoma City, a lot of rural and uh, yeah. downtown stuff, too. But so if the chief was off, I would also ride out as a chief okay. if he was off. But as basically as a major, I was basically a uh, station officer in charge of my station on my shift. So uh, the last station I was at when I retired, I was in charge of... Uh, there was nine guys at my station. Okay. And I, I also read you, I mean, you, you filled many positions while you were there. You were a uh, supervisor of special operations section and uh, as well as in charge of the dispatchers. Talk about that a little bit. Uh, yeah, that was a, um, it was, it, matter of fact, it was, we'll, we'll get into it farther, you know, when we talk about other issues, but it was a, it was a point in my career where I needed to, I, I felt like for my sanity at that time, I needed to get off the rigs for a while. I was at a station that was just, I mean, nonstop, 24, you know, 24 seven, we were, we were gone. We were yeah. very seldom getting sleep. And I just, I was just at a point to where I didn't want to not start liking my job. So I right. w- took a position that was open to where I was kind of in charge over a little bit of our human resources and our, uh, Oklahoma City Fire Department. We, we do our own IT stuff. So I was kind of over the guys that did our, all of our computer stuff. And then I was over our dispatchers. I did that for a while, and then I moved into our special ops division, which was uh, I was in charge of the training, uh, continuing ed and training for our uh, our USAR team, our dive, underwater dive team, and our hazardous material team. Okay, awesome. Now, before we talk a little bit about April nineteenth, nineteen ninety five, of course, mm-hmm. before that, before that that happened. What, what would you say were the support systems that were in place? I know this is you know really early in all of this, all these kind right. of issues, but were there support systems in place? And what would you say? How is your service doing in supporting those that may have some emotional or mental issues? Um, at no fault of Oklahoma City Fire Department, yeah. I would say it was non-existent. Right, because it, it was just non-existent. That was just, uh, as you know, you know, you've been around back in back in the day. It just wasn't something that was talked about. You're right. It was. Yeah. Uh, you know, we had had an event in uh, in 1988, which I mentioned Benny Zellner, one of my mentors earlier. Right. He was him and two other gentlemen uh, were killed in a house fire that we were on, that I was on with, uh, and one of the guys that also died was the guy I went to rookie school with. Hmm. So, you know, after that, they they brought in like a critical, inc- I think they brought in like a team from like South Carolina, if I remember correctly. Okay. Because we had we had nothing in place. Right. Uh, at that time, the fire department chaplain position wasn't filled. It had kind of gone by the wayside at that time. And um, so it was uh, – they brought in people from South Carolina, which actually I think may have been all right because guys that did talk, I think they felt comfortable because these were people that we didn't know, that we wouldn't see again, that we you know, which I think sometimes is different than talking to somebody that you know, somebody from your own department. Yeah. You know, you don't, whether that trust factor's there or not, I don't know, but right. at that time, at that time earlier. But yeah, at that time, and like I said, again, no, no fault of Oklahoma City, right. the fire department. It was just non existent at that time. As it was, you know, across the board for almost yeah. every organization, I would say. Right, exactly. You are correct. So for me, Chris, when I look back on my life, and of course, a lot of my life has been in the fire service as well. I get into it early at the end of high school. and Mm-hmm. Early in my fire service, I remember very well. I, I was probably only a couple years in, and I remember being glued to the TV on April 19th, 1995, for the Oklahoma mm-hmm. City bombing incident. And it was a polarizing event. You know, yes. w- were, were you uh, scared? Like, were you on duty when that happened? Uh, yes, sir. I had come on duty that uh, Oklahoma City, we worked 24 hour shifts. 
um, and we had just started. We just come off our four days off. Oklahoma City, you work twenty four on, twenty four off. You okay. do that three times in a row, and then you're off four days. So right. I had just came back from my four days off. Reported for work that morning about. We have to be there at seven. I I'm usually there no later than six, drinking coffee and so. Right. Uh, yes, I had come on duty that morning. So it was your first day shift. Now, do you, you know, take me through that from receiving the call, if you can remember that. Yeah, we um, uh, we were just doing, of course, you know, we have each duties we do around the station on whatever days you work, you know, and Wednesday happened to be a yard day, so a lot of the guys were out mowing. Okay. I was one of three officers at the station that day. Uh, I was, I had just been a cat. I had been a captain uh, I'd probably been a captain a couple of years, but I was still one of the you know lower ranking captains because I hadn't been one that long. So I was the third officer at the station that day. Okay. And um, we were all just kind of the guys that come in from mowing and weed eating and do all that. We were kind of standing around the kitchen talking, and uh, we spe- spe- specifically remember not just because the the bomb detonated at nine o two, but we knew it was about nine o'clock. We were talking about going to the grocery store and getting breakfast, and getting it around, and. We felt the station. We heard it. We felt it. The glass rattled at the station. The station I was at at the time was just C5, uh, 17 blocks north of the Murrah building wow. of the bombing. Okay. And so we, we felt it, and there was a there was a train yard to the uh, east of our station, and we thought maybe a train had derailed or, you know, so we went out the east door of the station to look. Couldn't see anything, so we walked around to the south side of the station, looking back south towards downtown Oklahoma City. And saw the huge plume of smoke, you know, and we we didn't even wait to be dispatched. We self dispatched. At, at that station at my at that time we had an engine, a rescue ladder, and the hazardous materials unit. And right. I was the officer on the hazardous materials unit that day. So all three rigs we just uh we just ran to the rigs and self dispatched ourselves. Hmm. Knowing knowing we'd be one of the first in companies because of where we saw the smoke and where we were located. So we went ahead and dispatched ourselves. Right. Ex- explain if you can, if you don't mind, just uh-huh. uh, describe what it was like rolling up to that scene. Um, you know, it was it's one of the deals where, on the way, of course, we're discussing. You know, we're me and the driver just like you know, a thousand things run through our mind, and there was a building across the street from the bombing that had some remodeling going on, and so. You know, we were thinking because they were doing some adding some steel girders and stuff. We were thinking a welder's torch, you know, maybe mm, right. set it up. We, we were just going through our mind. And then about we were still about uh, six or seven blocks away from Fifth Street is where the Murrah Building sat on Fifth Street. Right. We started seeing uh, windows and stuff blown out of uh, businesses along uh, Broadway, a street we were traveling south on. Mm. And you know it. it we still couldn't had no earthly idea, of course, what we were going to roll up on, but we kind of ruled out anything like that. We're thinking there's no way a welder's torch and a settling deal is going to set off. You know, we're six blocks away and we've got windows blown out of businesses. You know. Wow. Okay. So we, uh, when we got to Fifth Street, we turned uh, back to the west and we parked our rig. And when we got off, you know, one of the first things I think when I talked to guys, some of my buddies, you know, we talked that night. One of the things, for our, first things we remember is. All these people just kind of running towards us, you know. So right. We've seen some walking wounded, and we didn't have a real good view of the building because we were kind of come. The street kind of had a little hill, so we weren't at the top of a little hill where we couldn't actually see the the actual base of the building, but we could still see all the debris and all the smoke. And uh, I mean, it was just but like you said, it was like something we'd never seen before. Nothing we were prepared for. All the chaos and the walking wounded, and the uh, and then once we got closer, the actual the actual debris that was still, I think I've told people, in fact, I can still remember not walking on glass and paper and whatever other debris for the longest time where you're not even walking on pavement because there's so much debris right. on, on the ground. Right. And, I mean, we all remember, I remember it very well, and obviously the iconic photo of you uh, holding that infant. Yes, sir. Um I uh, I can't imagine. I mean, uh, the weight of that was so much more than that infant's weight. You know. Yes. Um, it was a deal. You know, we were probably uh, not even an hour into the scene, probably 30, okay. 45 minutes, and we'd we'd help the police department guys get a lady out of the basement, and um, we were going to the south side of the uh, south side of the building to report 
to, we'd been called over there and, uh, hmm. a, a police officer, and I didn't know he was a police officer at the time because he was in street clothes. He just, uh, he came around the corner and said he had a critical infant. He needed help. He had a critical infant. Right. And, you know, it's better these days, but, you know, 20 something years ago, police were, they weren't trained in any kind of first aid or medical, you know. Right. So I just, I, I, you know, my mom says there's a reason why it was me and, you know, it was still, I just said, here, I'll, I'll take, take the baby, you know, and, uh, he handed, he handed Bailey to me right. and, you know, and of course the photo was, we didn't know anything about a photo until later that night till 1130 at night. And we can, we can get into that in a little bit if you, if you want to, but yeah. uh, it was just, a, you know, looking back and seeing when the, the photo was taken and what I was doing. Um, I know what was going through my mind was that because by that time we had saw the front of the building and saw the crater and saw the building and the condition it was in. And, and, uh, you know, and the only person I'd seen at that time we took out alive, you know, she was alive, the lady we got out of the basement. So I'm, right. I'm sitting there holding Bailey and I'm just thinking how real this is and how, and I remember it being quiet. I mean, I couldn't hear a thing. I was just looking at her thinking, wow, somebody's world is fixing to be turned upside down, you know, and not realizing mm-hmm. even at that moment, not realizing that, you know, there'd be 169, you know, fatalities that day, but just thinking at that single moment about how, uh, cause I had a, uh, I had a two-year-old at home. My oldest one, who's 25 now, he was two at the time. So, hmm. you know, so it really hits home, you know, when, yeah. when I'm looking at her and, and thinking how somebody's world is just is just going to be destroyed. And I was down there holding her, waiting. I had already checked for signs of life, and I didn't see any. Yeah, yeah. I had walked over to an ambulance, and the paramedic was there. And the reason I was standing there holding her, waiting, there's a larger photo of it where you can see him on the ground. He's getting a blanket out. The ambulance was already full. The stretchers were full, and like he said, he said we're not going to put that baby on the ground. Right. And he was getting a blanket out for me to put her on. So that's that's the moment, you know. Looking back now that I can see the photo, once yeah. I did, you know, no, that's 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 the moment they captured. Yeah, and it's definitely a powerful moment. Now, Chris, how long were you on scene? Um, we, of course, we self dispatched at the time of the blast, and we were sent back to the station about ten or. Between ten and eleven o'clock that night, we were we were finally told, "Hey, y'all go back and right. take a break and get some rest." So, what a fourteen-hour, so, fourteen-hour shift, fourteen-hour day yeah. at or event. Right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, you're traveling back to the station from that scene. Mm-hmm. What's the environment like inside that truck? You know, there was a lot of. Uh, a lot of head scratching and a lot of uh a lot of it was really pretty quiet it really yeah. didn't really talk start talking about it till we got back to station it was pretty quiet everybody had you know everybody had used the phone on the hazmat unit we'd all called our you know our respective spouses and checked in and let them know hey we're okay and because there were so many just like with any event there were so many rumors you know and stories going around about firefighters being hurt along with people and so right and so, you know, it was just a, uh, uh, you know, I think by that time the news had traveled that, uh, you know, that they were thinking it was, uh, of course, you know, we're all guilty of it. You know, it was a Middle Eastern person, you know, at that right. time. we It's so what we were told. So right. we were all, you know, saying our piece and, you know, and, yeah. and, yeah. and, and, and feeling venting. the anger. You're venting off. And, yeah, right. And feeling yeah. the anger. And then, and then uh, you know, I, I remember specifically one firefighter saying, you know, uh, a guy named Mike Walker that uh, he said, you know, I didn't see a live person all day long or we didn't take out one live person. Wow. You know, so I mean, that was just kind of the general talk of, you know, the day. And it was uh, like I say, it was somber. And uh, and like I say, the uh, the, uh, you know, that lady we got out first was we, we did remove one other lady who was uh, talking to us when we got her out. But then we learned the next day when they started listening the 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 dead that she was one of them and we just remember because you know just like any medical call we were trying to get her name and her information and right so we could pass it along we just specifically remembered her name and that she was pregnant and she kept telling us that she was pregnant and uh we we learned the next day that she also passed away so hmm. so like i say it was just a somber there was anger there was you know yeah reflection there was uh you know so it was just it was a pretty long ride back to the station oh, i bet the longest ride um right you know and so you're back at the station. 
Uh, I assume you stayed probably at the station for a while. You're probably nowhere near ready to go home and and you know and to do that and to unpack all of that. I assume. What you know? When did people start sort of to talk, or did they start to talk, or were there was there any talk of some services, some support systems that were on the way for you guys, or or no? Yeah, now at the bombing, yeah, and just we had actually we we weren't going to get off till seven o'clock the next morning. Part of it, but right. we actually we got, we got yeah. back. We actually I think we actually made a house fire like at one thirty in the morning. So mm. it was a pretty eventful day. But before, and I should back up before we left the scene, we did go through a debriefing deal. They okay. had been we had developed since we lost the firefighters in eighty eight, and had some few other events. We had some pretty big floods here, and so right. with some. So they, we did at that time, at the time of the, the bombing, we had just started into having our own CISM team. Okay. You know, uh, it was, like I say, it was in the infancy stages. It was, and it kind of cratered from the start because they didn't, well, they didn't necessarily, which I think is wrong. They didn't force you to talk, but you felt like you were forced to say something or talk in this right. room. And then it was found out that somebody from the CISM had told, somebody what somebody had said that they experienced and yeah. so so it kind of went downhill from there as far as that happened a lot in the i think in the early stages of a, a lot of schism you know procedures right. i think that probably happened right and and, and, I, and i don't think it was in necessarily going you know uh hey so and so right i think mean, it was some of it was in concern yep. but you know just not learning that you know it's okay maybe to tell a story that you heard but you don't need to associate names and then, right because there was still that stigma of, well, if you're struggling, if you're, it's okay to feel bad about it and have some emotions about it. But if you're struggling with it, you might be a little weak, you know. Yeah, that's right. That was still the stigma back then, that's you know. Right. So uh, it was kind of, uh, so they, but they did, they, uh, they, they tried, and they had the, they did have the options besides the CSN. They, they eventually, there over the next two weeks, there was, there was counselors down there, and you know, and then they, so that they did supply or you know make available any counseling if anybody needed it okay all right and how so so now how are you like how are you after that describe your life after <laughs> oh uh well and here's the strange thing <laughs> my uh my life afterwards was and like i say and, and a lot of this i can say now that i didn't learn until you know i didn't start really struggling with emotions where it started affecting my personal life and all that until like just like 2005 or 2006 really okay you know yeah. 10 years after hmm. but when i when i when i learn that what i was going through i can look back two years after three years after and see little little things you know right that now i would know to catch or now i can tell people to look out for you know when then i'm just thinking <clears throat> i'm just thinking then you know uh eh, bad day you know bad week you know, not really putting it together. It was other things, you know, yeah. accumulating on me. And uh, and it one of the things I did struggle with, but I just learned um, and to back up. Yeah, I felt like I had to carry my persona that I had always had. I was always this happy-go-lucky guy, always the you know, always the guy with the funny line or the joke, and felt like I had to keep the you know, I was the one that kept everybody else's you know spirits up and yeah and you, always had, and you know and you had this superhero iconic picture of you right on so I every just television I to be, right and me and aaron had become friends that was set up aaron is bailey's mom the baby okay. that i was holding a reporter got us together and and it kind of ignited a friendship our families are still friends today hmm. and uh well and it was one of those deals to where you know if you make calls throughout the day you go back to station yeah you, you know you you, you have emotions about it, you think about it, but you never, nine out of ten times, you never hear from the people again, you don't see them again, unless you run on them again, you know, you don't, you don't see their family at the hospital because you don't have to, tra you know, we didn't transport, you know, or whatever. Right. Well, this was a deal to where we saw these people's faces every day in the media, you know, because the story right. was so big. That's right. And then once I met, once I met Aaron, it's a great thing, but I think I felt one of the things I struggle with the most, which I had to learn I had no control over, but it's was the guilt. I, I was I carried a huge amount of guilt being the last one to hold her baby. 
I just, yeah. I, that was something I, I, you know, no, no parent, number one, should have to hold their, their baby like that. But right. for me to be the last one to, to hold her baby was uh, something I really, really struggled with. Mm. And, and it's weird to talk about now because even like when I try to tell my story, yeah. it's like I have to jump ahead to say, you know, I didn't know I was struggling with this until I <laughs> yeah. reached the, you know, I reached a certain point to where I started learning all this stuff. And, That's right. Yeah. And that was one of the things I struggled with. And, and, and what I found dealing with once I was diagnosed with PTSD and dealing with it was it's, it's not a single event. I mean, a single event can, can maybe right. be the one that pushes you over the edge. Right. But my, my PTSD was not solely related to, that bombing, that photo, you know, it's, it's, right. uh, we were going back on years, you know, the fire alarm I was on, we lost the three firefighters, stuff that, stuff that occurred in my childhood. I mean, it was just crazy yeah. accumulation of, of life that, that if you don't know what to look out for and how to deal with it, it'll just sneak up on you. And that's, and that's what happened to me. So, so what happened in the early 2000s? What did you start noticing that might have led you to believe that, wait a minute, like this, something might be going on here? Well, you know, I just, I started, um, it was more like a, um, like a depression. It was more mm-hmm. like I became not, and rec- I say more recluse, not to the fact that I wasn't social, I didn't talk, but I wasn't that same personality and my wife had noticed and, um, you know, I'd always coach my boys in little league growing up and kind of stuff came, you know, if I. If I could get off for a game, I would get off. You know, I, I used to pay people. I would pay bucks to get off, so I, I'd never miss some of my son's activities. Right. Well, you know, now I'm like, well, you know, I can't get off. It was just like it didn't matter. Mm-hmm. Things just like that. And I look back going, golly, it was because that's not me, you know. Yeah. I just thought it was a phase I was going through or midlife crisis, uh, you know. And, and I say this jokingly. Mm-hmm. Now, I think when guys feel that way, they all go for the. Well, I must be low on testosterone. I must be, you know, because that's the yeah. big thing now, you know, low yeah. T. Yeah. Uh, that's why you're depressed. That's why you have no energy. That's why you have, well, I was feeling all those things, but it was, uh, it was the, it was the PTSD. And I had, a, you know, one of the triggers that really got me one time was we were, uh, where we live now, we were, we were putting in a pool and they had busted out some concrete and it started raining. Hmm. And the smell hmm. of that wet concrete dust. Yeah. Because it had rained the day of the bombing it rained right. that afternoon and it doesn't it didn't send me into any kind of uh you know traumatic breakdown but it uh it was a trigger uh, it was uh which then of course i'm i can say trigger now because i know what it is then yeah. i didn't know it was a trigger i just thought kind of smells like the bombing and went on about my business right not knowing it's the things it's doing to my mind and my spirit the whole time yeah so obviously that starts to deteriorate a little bit and you start to become more aware and then Mm -hmm. you you get diagnosed with PTSD when? Um, About 2000 and probably 2007 or 8. Right. Before I, you know, and of course, you know, by that time I was out of the house, me and my wife were separated, we're back together now, Uh, everything's great. Yeah. (laughs) But, uh, you know, I was, we were separated, I was living on my own i was not being near the father or the husband i needed to be to my wife my two sons things were just and and what was so sad was when i first was diagnosed with ptsd well that was my ace in the hole now i had a reason you know and that now i I use that as the reason i was acting like i you know instead of manning up and getting help for it i just continued what i was doing and writing it off as well i got an excuse look at me i got ptsd when ptsd was all those decisions I was making were conscious decisions to, yeah. you know, to do wrong. But, yeah. of course, it's just hard to relate, you know, that state of mind. But, like I say, I just, uh, yeah, I was I was so bright that I used that as an excuse to keep, <laughs> to, keep yeah. to keep living like I was living. That's yes, how, right. Yeah, exactly. That's how brilliant I am. So, so, uh, so what happened that made you, that made you realize enough's enough that it's time to get help? Um. I had a guy, I had a friend, you know, because me and my wife were battling, going back and forth. We were, yeah. I had, I had filed for divorce. We didn't go through with it, but I had filed for divorce. And I, I, I knew that's what I didn't want, but I felt like 
I felt like it was the next step in my progression. Does that right. make sense? Yeah. I had I had done all this stuff, and of course I'm dealing. You know, I can't look at I can't even look at the face I'm seeing in the mirror anymore. You know, I'm to the things I've done to my family and embarrassed my family and humiliated my wife and just just on and on. I thought, well, this is the next step. You file for divorce, you know, and you get out of her life so she can start a new one. And uh, and I never did back up. I never did have. I had those thoughts sometimes where, you know, well, if something happens, they'd be better off without me. But I never contemplated, you know, me being the one to end my life. I never, I never had the suicidal thoughts. No. Okay. But I, uh, but I just, I just got to a point where I felt that was the next step was uh, file for divorce. Well, I had a guy, um, a mentor guy, kind of just basically grabbed me by the head one time and said, "Look," he said, "Look at me." He said. He goes, if you love your wife and you want to make it work, you go tell her. You quit making excuses. He said, if you want to keep doing this. And he basically said, you know, how can you help other people and be a hero to other people? Which, you know, we, we use that word loosely. People say right. you're heroes. We say we're just doing our job. Right. So basically what he says, how can you be a hero to anybody or help anybody, however you want to phrase it, if you can't even help yourself and help your family? Yeah, good point. So yeah. it was just it was just kind of the way he told me. He said, you know, be a hero to yourself and to your family first, and then then take care of everybody else. Hmm. And that just kind of I don't know. I just thought, what a that would be an amazing turnaround if I could pull it off. And uh, and uh, went went and got uh, some counseling. And went away to a place in California for a week or so to okay. post traumatic uh, uh, West Coast post traumatic. Uh, retreat place and okay. uh got the help i needed and learned how to deal with it and accepted you know just it's kind of like anything in life you, just, you know there's some things i can control and some i can't and uh the ones i can control i'm going to control and the other ones i can't i'm not going to let them control me <laughs> yeah yeah that's so. true that's very true what now so how would you obviously you got diagnosed you finally went and got help mm -hmm. how would you say you're doing now I would say since everything, me and my wife have been back together since 2011, 2011, about 11. Okay. And not to take away from anything else in our past, but our last seven years together have been, and with my family, have been probably more rewarding and everything than the previous, you know, 20 before that. Hmm. It's, uh, and I think it's just, uh, I don't know. I guess I can just look back and see where we were. Yeah. You know, there's not, there's sometimes me and my wife will, something will happen and she'll say, you know, well, you know, back when we weren't together, back we, if we're talking about a certain story. Yeah. But yeah. it's always refreshing when we get done just to look back and see where we are now and think, wow. So it's just, I know I'll never be there again because hmm. I, I, I won't allow it. I, I know how to deal with it. Um, so like I say, I'm, I'm just, um, I'm at a point now to where, um, uh, I'm, I'm doing this kind of stuff. I want to start. To, uh, I want to start keeping people from having to experience what I did, or at yeah. least be able to know that they're heading in that direction. Not everybody's going. You know, it's a small percentage that are diagnosed with PTSD. Yeah, but it, but it still doesn't mean they're not going to have the emotions and the feelings. You know, on that's right on certain things. So yeah, we we need we need you, Chris. We need we need you telling your story. Like, welcome to the community <laughs> because you're you're vital to this and. You know, so you, you seem to be doing well. Now, you just recently left uh, the fire service. So mm -hmm. b before you left, how would you rate the fire service as far as how have they grown in the support of its members with, with mental issues, whether it be PTSD or any other <laughs> of the issues? Well, I'll put it this way. I'll sum it up with saying I've seen a, a, a an amazing change. I've seen even at my station when I was – we would make calls, you know, and – come back to the station and be able to you know we wouldn't dwell on it but i'd be able, we could we could talk about it nobody was shy about you know if something bothered them or if something upset them and uh you know i got to when i retired i was in a position where if we were on first aid calls you know the other guys were in there doing the first aid i'm standing there with the family members getting information or whatever you know right and and i told them sometimes that's just as hard you're standing there with a lady that's been married to this gentleman for 70 years Mm. And she's not going to wake up with him tomorrow. She's asking you how she's going to do that. Yeah. 
you know, so we come back to station, we talk about stuff like that, and uh, which would have never been done 20 years ago. And, right. it, and, it, and it's come so far that Oklahoma City started a rookie class at the 1st of February, and part of the rookie academy was me and two other guys that have gone through P- PTSD going to talk to the rookies about it. So, Perfect. That's excellent. Yeah, that was, I can say that was something that wouldn't even been, uh, you know, dreamt of. 20 years ago. Yeah, you that's know? right. And and so now it's part of the they're making it part of the curriculum of rookie school. You know. Awesome. And it's not and it's not to scare people and say this is going to happen to you. This, you know, right. you are going to have PTSD, you are, but it, we're just letting them know that hey, you, you're in this job. The guys that are going to last on this job do 20, 25 years, 30 yeah. years. Yeah. It's because you have a heart for it. Well, if you have a heart for it, then calls are going to affect you emotionally, you know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we always tell guys, you know, because you get jabbed at the fire station, you know, hang your feelings on the hook when you get your bunker coat in the morning, what we always tell new boys, because you're going to get picked on, you know. So yeah. hang your feelings on the hook, but you can't hang your emotions on the hook. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you're, right. you know, you're going to have calls that uh, that bother you, and it's okay. It's You're human. Yeah. And a lot of people, a lot of guys come into this service thinking they're, they're in this business or they're superhuman. Well, you do superhuman things, but you also see things that, a lot of humans will never see and shouldn't have to see, so you just have to be ready for it. Hmm. Uh, Chris, if if people want to reach out to you, contact you, hopefully bring you somewhere to talk to mm-hmm. any kind of groups or anything like that, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, well, I'm I'm on Twitter at uh, it's at uh, ff4ou. Yep. So, I, and then um, that's re- I'm, I, and it's funny you mentioned that I'm actually working on. I'm getting with the guy. I'm trying to build me a little website Perfect. because that's what I want to do. I'm, I'm actually selling fire equipment for a company right now, but I okay, want to, perfect. I'd love to put that aside and travel the country and, and, and speak and teach to what level I can teach, you know, helping people. And I've kind of, I am kind of working with a couple of people. I don't know if I can say their name or not, but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's up to you, you brother. Care, you can say whatever you want. But it's, it, well, it's a, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an organization called Safe Call, SafeCallNow.org. Okay. And uh, a guy called, named Sean. Okay. Yeah, SafeCallNow.org. Okay. Uh, outstanding organization, and a guy named Jay Dobbins. He's a former ATF guy. And oh wow. He's kind of been talking to them, and that's what they do. They, they, of course, they've been doing it. They've been doing it for years, and and that's just where I want to head. So I think, I, I think I'm now seeing now that. I, I say it's 20 something years later and I can go back to my mom and say, maybe you were right. Maybe there was a reason <laughs> it was me, you know, and, yeah. uh, and maybe that's it. Maybe to, maybe to keep people from, and it sounds so cliche, you know, if you can keep one person from, you know, experiencing yep. it, you know, if that one person keeps one person and it's just kind of get a snowball effect. So that's, that's what I'm looking to do. So that's why when, uh, yeah. you contacted me and I followed you on Twitter and we got together, I was really excited about coming on here. Oh, Chris, I can't, well, I can think of no better person to go out and do the things that you want to do. I mean, as for first responders in general, but specifically for the fire service, which right. I think the fire service is is the one service that's lagging behind in all of this. Oh, there's, my gosh. They're totally sort of the last that. ones to come because I think it's just such a huge stigma, and no one wants to say, you know, think that it might be weak, quote, unquote. Right. And, you know, if the fire service is really one of the slowest ones to let go of this and to move I, and, forward. And it's, it's funny you mention that, Sean. I've noticed that it's, when I look on Twitter and I look on LinkedIn and all these places and I see all these all these organizations for law enforcement. Yeah. You know, and it's not, I mean, I'm not blaming law, fire, law enforcement. If they're doing the right thing. There's yeah. all these different organizations that are strictly for law enforcement, for suicide prevention, for PTSD, for, and you look and there's, there's and of course, I'm not smart enough to know how to start any that kind of stuff, but there, <laughs> there's, there's not many out there just strictly for, and these law enforcement, they welcome in firefighters and oh, first yeah. responders. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But their main focus and their background is law enforcement. Yeah. And I don't see very many with the background and their focus being firefighters. You're right. EMS. You're right. So. Yeah, for sure. We need to change that. I'm sure you're going to be a part of that, Chris. Well, um, yeah, I would love, yeah, we, we, me and you both, we need to be a part of it. Absolutely. And, uh, so, Chris, if there's someone listening right now who's who may be struggling on any level, if they were in front of you, what would you say to them? First thing I would tell them is if they will just if they will if they will reach out, 
just they'll be shocked at how many how many people are reaching back to help them it's, mm-hmm. it's it floored me because i i was really i was still nervous about it about admitting and uh, but it's just it's just crazy the amount of support and help and and especially if you love the job you're doing yeah, that's what i would tell them if you love the job you're doing and you don't want this to change that then you you need to reach out and get help i'm a perfect example i was getting ready to quit the fire service after about 24 years Hmm. And because of reaching out and getting the help I needed, I was able to do another, you know, seven years. And, uh, wow. And so that's, I would just tell them just, just to reach out. I would, I don't know, I'd probably just beg them, <laughs> you know, to, to, uh, yeah. yeah. Because it is, it's, it's a, it's a first step. It's, a, it seems like a hard step, but then once you get to where I'm at now, right. I look back and think, what a, what a simple step it really was and all the support that's out there that's why I, like me and you both said we need to make more of a presence of firefighter groups out there to help people that are dealing with it mm, yeah well said Chris brother this has been awesome um, it's a real pleasure talking to you I, I want to thank you for just for speaking about this issue it, it, it's uh, we need more people like you it's you know it's an honor talking to you and just and hearing your story, and I, I know it's going to be you're probably going to tell the story many many more times now, <laughs> and I and I hope that is the truth, but thank you sir for for taking the time and and for talking to us today. Oh, you bet it's been an honor and thank you for what uh, for what you do for this podcast that uh, you know for the people you have on here that uh, you know, like I say it's people like you that have to you know have these programs going getting the word out so i appreciate your work also we all have a part to play yes sir i agree <laughs> my pleasure thanks chris Tison, uh take care of yourself and your family and if there's anything we can ever do or i can ever do just please reach out but uh, we'll stay in touch but again yes, thank you and uh, you know enjoy the rest of your day thank you you as well sir all right thanks all right bye bye now my shift is finally over i gotta deal with what's mine Man, that was good. I really enjoyed that. I hope you guys did too. Just recently, a couple days ago, I received an email from Chris just giving giving an update for us. I'll read it. He says that he's now working with Sean Riley and Jay Dobbins and doing some speaking on his own. You can read about the training at www.com armorupnow.org that's A-R-M-O-R U-P-N-O-W dot org and just go into the training section Sean presents uh, a talk called Armor Up Jay presents Catching Hell and Chris does First In three real stories about guys who reached out for help when they needed it so check that out Chris is also working with a few speakers' bureaus, uh, trying to become uh, part of their teams. That'll be great. He has a Facebook page called First In, so check that out. And he wants to thank you guys all for listening, for taking the time. Also, he wanted to reiterate that you can reach him at CL Fields, so that's C L F I E L D S. 64 at att.net and he's also on Twitter at FF4OU he was so great thanks Chris for taking the time Uh, I love talking to you okay let's talk about an event that's coming up a few events but in the same place so if you are going to be in the St. John's area the beginning of June we now have something you can go do on June 7th that's a Thursday there's going to be a showing of the Other Side of the Hero documentary if you haven't seen it, get out and see it that's going to be at uh, Memorial University and then Friday the 8th is an all day education day with the Temacon Memorial Trust go to tema.ca and I'm sure you'll find everything to do with that if you'd like to register and take part in that It'll be awesome. I'm sure some of the ambassadors are going to be there. Jamie McWhorter is going to be there for sure, our Newfoundland ambassador. If you haven't met him yet, 
He's a riot. Love him. Then, on the 9th, Jamie is heading out on a two-week tour all around Newfoundland. He's going to be stopping at police departments, fire halls, shelters, wherever he can find people with PTSD. Plus, there's going to be meetings of the PTSD buddies. He'll be making videos with people he chats with, driving between locations. It's going to be a road tour. It's going to be awesome. I know it's in partnership with Tema and also with Spartan Wellness. They're going to be going to 10 different Royal Canadian Legions across the island. They'll be hosting PTSD and marijuana education nights with a free barbecue. You can't beat free food, people. Here's the schedule. June 10th, Conception Bay South. June 11th, Bay Roberts. June 12th, Carboneer. June 13th, Clarenville. June 14th, Catalina. The 15th in Gander. The 18th in Cornerbrook. The 20th in Stephenville. The 22nd in Deer Lake. And the 23rd in Porta Basque. That's going to be awesome. If you can catch any of that, please check it out. All right. Thanks, everybody, for continuing to support this podcast. Thanks to everyone who continuously shares and leaves comments and feedback. Please do that. It means a lot to me. I love doing this podcast. This is my way of doing what I can for this movement. It does take a lot out of me to do it. I will tell you that. It takes a lot of time and a lot of... A lot of emotional currency, if I can say it that way, if that makes sense. I'm exhausted after each one, after each chat. Brings up a lot of stuff for me, and I need a little bit of downtime in between. So, But I love doing it, because I think it helps people, and it does help me to continuously talk to people about this subject. If you like it, please share it. Do whatever you're comfortable doing. Share it, subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Google Play Music or really on any other app that you would use to listen to podcasts. You should be able to search Tema Talks and it should come up. If it doesn't, let me know and I'll fix it right away. We still have our Facebook page contest running. We're almost at 800 now. We're trying to get to 1,000. When we get to 1,000, we're going to have a draw for five Tema swag bags. It's going to be good. So that's continuing to go well. So if you can share the page, if you're already following it, just share it to let people know. If you think it may be something that they may find helpful, that would be great. All right, so you're going to hear from me again in a few days. So until then, more love, less judgment. Because we ain't superheroes, we're just ordinary people Trying to make a difference, and the first on every scene And it's a heavy, heavy burden to carry all this hurting When you can't unsee the things you've seen It keeps going Sirens are gone.